Hello, I'm Lorraine Williams with Vallejo Bible College. Welcome to this edition of In the Classroom. Today, we will be discussing a topic that, for better or worse, can always grab the spotlight, forgiveness. I know, it's a tough one, but a very necessary one. So necessary that God commands it of us. Let us pray. Father, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this time, Lord. And we dedicate this time to you, dear Lord. Have your way, Father. Send this discussion, your word, forward, dear Lord. Thank you for those that your word will touch. Thank you that it will encourage someone. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask. Amen, and thank you, Lord. People dealing with or have dealt with the emotional pain, the physical pain, and the spiritual pain of forgiveness are always ready to hear something that will validate them, encourage them, or comfort them on the subject. And the dialogue usually goes something like this. Forgiving those who wronged you will free you. Unforgiveness gives your offender the power. Take back your power. Hanging on to unforgiveness only hurts you, not them. You forgive for you, not for the other person. It's not about them. Well, for the sake of this discussion, let's just say it is about them. We're just going to try that on for today. First, let's look at the two words that form the conjunction forgive. The for in forgive is indeed for you. And it also looks like the give in forgive is for you also. However, the give is for you to give away. And it's most likely to the person who hurt you. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he said, Father, forgive them. That simple but mighty act of grace and humility snatched the destructive power out of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a weapon that Satan uses to torment us. Unforgiveness creates unrest, anxiety, bitterness, sickness, stress. It steals our peace. It steals our joy. It takes up most of our, our time. And now you're in a spiritual wrestling match with righteousness versus unrighteousness, with obedience versus disobedience. You are trying to justify what cannot be justified. God has commanded you to do something that you are feeling too hurt to do, which now seriously interferes with your relationship with God. Don't you think for one moment that Paul did not recognize the internal battle that unforgiveness can bring to our very soul. Paul was very aware of the damaging consequences of unforgiveness when placed in Satan's hand. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2 and 10, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan, look at this, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Paul is not concerned with who the offender was or what the offense was or how severe the offense was, or if an offense actually even took place. The only concern that Paul has is that forgiveness was given, which immediately took the power out of unforgiveness. In other words, Paul is telling Satan, unforgiveness is not one of your schemes you will use on the saints today. Satan, you can put unforgiveness back in your bag of tricks because we are aware 
of your scheme, Satan, and we will not be out with it. Not today. And you know what, saints? We have to tell Satan the same thing. Not today, Satan. Look, the only reason Satan can outwit us on this one, on unforgiveness, is because of pride. We think and we feel to forgive is to swallow our pride, but it is not. We think to forgive is to give in and to give up. We think that forgive is giving up a piece of us, but that's not so, saints. To forgive is a strong act of grace and humility. Let me tell you something. Pride is kryptonite to the Christian soul. Pride is kryptonite to the Christian soul. It darkens our spiritual insight. It weakens our spiritual sharpness and alertness. Yet there is power in humility. Humility strengthens and empowers us in the spiritual things of God. Jesus suffered an unjust and inhumane death. We would say Jesus had every reason not to forgive. We would say Jesus had every right not to forgive. Yet Jesus knew there was no reason not to forgive. He knew he had no right not to forgive because he gave that right up. And we must do the same thing. We must give that right up. Even though Jesus was bloody, he was battered, he was bruised, his flesh was torn, he was disfigured to the point that his own mother couldn't recognize him. Yet Jesus understood that his offenders were in far worse shape than he was. Even though he was hanging on that cross, he understood that his offenders were still in worse shape than he was. And if you think about your offenders, you might come to the same conclusion. Jesus addresses man's need. Jesus forgave because he wanted to draw his offenders to him, not to forgive them so that he could be free of them, but so that his crucifiers, his murderers, his betrayers, his backstabbers, his mockers would be free in him. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who give life has set you free from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation, saints, in Christ Jesus. Satan cannot accuse you of anything in Christ Jesus because anything that Satan can accuse you of, you have already asked for forgiveness for. You have already repented from. There is no condemnation. Satan, you cannot accuse me of anything because now this, the law of the spirit that now resides in me is the law of grace. It's the law of humility. It's the law of compassion, the law of grace. Ah, Jesus forgave because it was his desire to fulfill his father's most fervent desire that man be saved. Hebrews 1 through 3 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. Unforgiveness hinders our peace and our relationship with God. 
and it entangles us in a web of feelings and emotions. It entangles us in the things that are not of God. It entangles us in the things that make us feel better about not forgiving. It entangles us and it, it comforts us in our emotions. We must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and what he did and how graciously he did it. We must scorn unforgiveness. Nothing could keep Jesus from the cross, not even the shame of it. He scorned the shame of the cross. Nothing would come between him getting to God and bringing us with him. We must scorn unforgiveness. Nothing or no one is allowed to come between God and you. Jesus didn't forgive, forgive them to release himself from the stress or the sickness or the sleepless nights that unforgiveness can bring. He forgave so that his haters, his mockers, his backstabbers might come to know him as their Lord and Savior, thereby obtaining eternal life with him. Jesus proclaims in the heavenly assembly in Hebrews 2.13b, Here am I and the children God has given me. Those children he's talking about, that's you and that's me. This is a proud moment for Jesus. And we, saints, we are his pride. Can't you hear Jesus saying, I fought the devil himself for these that I now present to you. They took up their cross and joined me in the work of salvation. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We left off with Jesus presenting us to the heavenly assembly, those who have joined him in the work of salvation or co-laborers. With a common plan, co-laborers work toward a common goal. So in, as Christians and co-laborers with Christ, God's burning desire that man repent and be saved must now also be our most pressing desire and our most burning concern is that man repent and be saved. This concern must take priority, saints, over our personal feelings and our, our personal pain and our, surf, our suffering that an offense can cause. It is e it's not easy, but it is possible. Through Christ, all things are possible. Let me tell you, Satan loves it when we get stuck in our feelings. He loves it when we get stuck in our emotions. He loves it when we ask advice from the wrong people. That's less work he has to do to sway our thinking to the dark side. But when you can press through your feelings, when we can press through our feelings, when we can press through our emotions, your pain and your suffering turns to purpose and joy. Purpose and joy, saints, it does not come when you are feeling validated. Purpose and joy does not come when you are feeling comforted and encouraged, but Purpose and joy comes when your act of forgiveness turns a heart of stone into a heart of 
flesh. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Saints, sometimes people lose their way, fall in with the wrong company. And the Bible clearly states, bad company corrupts good character. And you better believe that. And it goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, come back to your senses. Sometimes folks lose their godly compass and need to be brought back to their good senses, to their godly senses. As sheep, we do stray and need to be brought back. And the longer we leave them to themselves or leave them in bad company, their hearts will harden. The longer we leave them in a bad place, their hearts will adjust to unrighteousness. But praise be to God, saints. You do have a heart of flesh and you can forgive. And your act of forgiveness and your act of grace and your act of humility can touch a heart. Forgiving your offender frees them to become a prisoner in the Lord. Ephesians 4.1 says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. Saints, we want God to get the glory out of our lives. We want to live up to what Jesus did for us. We said yes to the call. Now we must participate in the work. This work is not for the faint of heart. As co-laborers, we are expected to do just what Jesus did, forgive. We are expected to show the same compassion to our offenders as Jesus showed toward his. We are expected to show humility, the same humility Jesus showed. We are also expected to show. We must adjust our spiritual lenses to see our offenders need for forgiveness. You don't forgive because it frees you, but because when freely given the right for the right reasons, it matures you spiritually. Then and only in maturity could I say forgiveness is what co-laborers do. And it is simply our reasonable service, saints. Yes, I had to go through the process to learn that God does not command us to do anything that we cannot physically, emotionally, or spiritually do. If God commands us to forgive, no matter the offense, no matter the pain, we must remember and trust that. There's four things we have to remember and we have to trust. Number one, God's ways are higher than ours. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. God is in a league all by himself. He is all-knowing and all-powerful. The potter knows what it will take to mold us and shape us into what is required of us to be a part of his eternal kingdom. He knows how to shape us and mold us into the relationship he would want us to have with him here on earth and in heaven. Number two, he always, God always has a higher purpose for us. Psalms 57 2 says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. We can be certain of one thing, saints. God's purpose is heavenward. God created us to have fellowship with him. God created us to have a relationship with him. Like I said before, 
He created us to have fellowship, a relationship with him here on earth and in heaven. Number three, God always, get this, God always seeks to mature us spiritually. First Corinthians 13, 11 says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man or one man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Saints, this is not child's play. Satan is serious. He will take you out any way he can using whatever he can. Don't you think, don't you think for one moment that unforgiveness is just a technicality and Satan can't take you out on it? Don't you think for one minute that your unforgiveness will not be judged because yours is a special case? Let me just give you a reality check here. Matthew 6, 15. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. And this particular scripture, just as with the one with Paul, it does not ask who the offender was or is. It does not ask what they did. It does not ask how badly you were hurt. It, God just says in Matthew 6, 15, but if you do not forgive others their sins, they didn't name the sins. Scripture doesn't name the sins. Your father will not forgive your sins. It's not any plainer than that. Now, I'm not going to interpret that particular scripture, but I will say this. That sounds like a problem to me. If my sins are not forgiven, that's a problem. What kind of a relationship can I expect to have with God if he put it that plainly? That if my sins, if I can't forgive other sins, my sins won't be forgiven. It is imperative that we grow up in our spiritual thinking and our spiritual understanding. We must understand that we are in spiritual warfare every single day because every single day Satan is looking to take you out. If you think unforgiveness is a technicality, he's looking to take you out on your own thinking. Number four, you will always reap the benefits of being obedient. You will always reap the benefits of being obedient. No matter how difficult it is to be obedient, you will reap the benefits of being obedient obedient. First John 3 24 says the one who keeps God's command lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he talking about God lives in us. We know it by the spirit. He talking about God gave us and that spirit will guide us into the deeper things of God that spirit will encourage and comfort us and never leave us nor forsake us, never lead us wrong. That spirit will grow us in God and in the things of God. That spirit will stretch us. It will mature us in the things of God, in Christ. And because of Christ, we can forgive. You must remember we are new creatures in Christ. And let me tell you, being a new creature in Christ, that will be put to the test. Satan will put you through the test. As soon as you proclaim that you are now in Christ and that you believe everything Christ did for you has now been credited to us and that we are now going to walk in Christ, Satan is going to put that to the test. 
And if he has to use unforgiveness, he will because he knows that unforgiveness, that that involves your pride. And if he can't get you on anything else, he will get you on your pride. And Satan cannot wait to test you as a new creature. You've proclaimed that you are a new creature in Christ, and now Satan is going to put you to, to the test. Satan is going to take you to task on that. Satan's like, oh, so you're a new creature in Christ, huh? All right, well, let's just put you to the test on that one. Let me just throw you a hard ball and see how you're going to catch it. In Christ, you can catch anything that Satan throws your way because in Christ, Satan cannot harm you. The only thing that Satan can do to you is what you allow Satan to do to him. But like Paul said, Satan cannot outwit us on this one, that we know your schemes. We are aware of your schemes and that you can use unforgiveness as a tool to bring us down, to stress us out, to make us sick, to, to mess up our relationship, to hinder our relationship with God. Satan knows that and he will use that. But as soon as you, I am a new creature in Christ, he will use that. He will test you and you can pass the test in Christ. And because of what Christ did, you can also do. Thanks for watching this edition of In the Classroom. You can view this episode and others on our YouTube channel. God bless you and take care.